Rome 2 has been expanded upon so many times that it's actually quite wild. And if every Total War game had this level of support, we'd be looking at a totally different series altogether. I want to start with culture packs first, because they are related to the Grand Campaign. I think culture packs are interesting concepts insofar as they bring something new to the game. But the shame about Rome 2's culture packs are that, yes, they do bring something new, but their main selling point is that they unlock already existing factions. This was unheard of in the past, and it should be a major no-no now as well. Culture packs would have been completely fine if they were sold with the premise of adding new mechanics and features to the factions presented. But it is a different thing when 50% of the purchase reason can be chalked down to simply unlocking something behind a paywall. And even then, it's not like Rome 2's culture packs completely changes how you play. The most egregious of the culture packs is the first one, the Greek States pack. This unlocks Athens, Sparta, and Epirus. Three factions that are so base game material that it hurts. They do come with some unique buildings and units and the like, but it's not like this justifies it. Further, playing these factions as opposed to the Romans or the Seleucids really highlights the extreme disappointment that constitutes Greece. There are so few cities in Greece, yet quite a few factions, that most of them only own either one or two. Sadly, it feels like Rome's province system sabotages a region like Greece, since it doesn't really allow for both smaller and larger cities to coexist even though this map is vast enough for it. I just feel like playing like either of these factions is awkward, since even though in its heyday Athens was a true colonial hegemon, Rome 2's province system and the lack of cities sadly doesn't allow for this kind of granularity and variety in what form of empire you wish to create. This also goes for the next culture pack. The Pirates and Raiders culture pack aims to bring you a new experience based on the Balkan cultures, opting for a focus on raiding through bonuses and buffs to these features. But you still play Rome 2 the same way essentially. It's not like these so-called pirate factions can create pirate outposts on faraway shores, infiltrate the cities of foreign empires and create pirate bases there and make their economy reliant on your connections and mafia mentality. You still have to command armies on the battlefield and play the 4x game as though you were a conquering empire. There is nothing game changing about this DLC, when it would have been awesome if there were. I will say it's kinda cool that your recruitment buildings also lend you income, and conversely that farm chain buildings can let you recruit cavalry if you specialize in that field. But other than that, I don't find that the experience changes enough for me to want to play them over my other favorite culture groups. I think the culture pack that mostly justifies its existence is the Desert Kingdoms pack, mostly because these factions are outside of the inner core of fundamental factions in Rome 2, but also because these factions inherently act more like the empires surrounding them. Both Massalia in Numidia and Kush below Egypt are realistic to imagine as empire builders in the classical sense. I still find that Rome 2's diplomatic systems do not allow for the type of economic gameplay mechanics you'd want from a faction like Kush though where trade routes and valuable resources could make you an even more important player if the mechanics were there to support you. I do think it's awesome though that these desert factions, depending on where they're located in the world, bring with them influences from the regional power they're closest to. The Numidians can support desert legionaries and Nabate offers desert hoplites, meaning we have Roman and Greek influences present in these factions. I want to reiterate that these culture packs, while adding factions, units, and a few tweaks to buffs and debuffs, they fundamentally do not offer new Total War experiences other than the regular change you get from changing the faction you're playing as. Creative Assembly might have learned their lesson post-Warhammer, with every new lord there having their own unique mechanics or spin on things. But this is not the case in Rome 2. And while it is valid to want to play as new cultures in different regions, there is not enough here for me to personally want to recommend any of these culture packs unless you have a personal affinity towards them and they're also on sale. On to the main meat of Rome 2's DLC now, and we're finally talking expansions. In my opinion, the main meat of a good old Total War DLC is the expansion. That experience where you get a whole new map with a remixed set of factions, new technologies, and the whole shebang. In other words, a new experience. The fact that expansion campaigns on the whole is where Total War offer new stuff in their games kinda sucks to be honest. But Rome 2 might ironically be where this is not the case, since as we've seen, CA actually came back to improve on the Grand Campaign years later. But that doesn't necessarily mean that what makes it into an expansion also manages to improve the Grand Campaign, which I truly implore Creative Assembly to start thinking about doing. The first expansion, or as they are now called, Campaign Pack for Rome 2, is Caesar in Gaul. What I'd like to call a very natural first step for a Roman themed game indeed. Caesar in Gaul adds a whole new map to Rome 2 focused on Gaul and parts of Northern Italy. 
I've always loved focus maps, because I find that they appear so much more realistic and immersive than their grand campaign counterparts. I mean, in reality, regions are so much more than just one or two cities, and campaign packs like these do help to explore that fact and reality. As such, Caesar and Gaul is mostly about Caesar and his Roman faction, and the many Gallic nations opposed to each other and to him. If you love Gaul and that most classic of Roman wars, and if you crave going up against waves of slightly less powerful versions of Asterix and Obelix, then this is certainly the place to be. Because of the time period of Caesar and Gaul, you actually get immediate access to those classic late Republic legionaries, which is awesome, but I think where Caesar and Gaul truly shines, and this goes for many of these campaign packs by the way, is in the way it changes up your technology tree. In fact, I think calling it technology is just wrong now, and the tech tree should instead be renamed into political maneuvering or something. Because what you essentially do here is make decrees and simulate in-faction political intrigue. What we unlock are historical events essentially, with the first military tech giving you a whole new general, Mark Antony. I love that it's not just about buildings and insignificant upgrades, but now you're actually straight up given more food, you're given more resources, and importantly, more Imperium. Caesar in Gaul toys around with Imperium more than the Grand Campaign, I'd say. Because as your Imperium grows, allowing you to field more armies, which you'll absolutely need in this campaign where you're virtually all alone against the world, Imperium also gives you diplomatic penalties with foreign factions and nets you less tax income. What's also interesting is that while the military tech upgrade requires turns to pass like normal, these civic upgrades can be completed in one turn, but now demand gold. This makes them more versatile but also more useful in a pinch. This becomes perhaps extra significant for the Gallic factions, most of whom are from the same Celtic culture. If you remember, Rome too allows people from the same tribal cultures to confederate. And since Rome is the big bad wolf of this campaign, as the Gauls, it's your job to unite before they eat you. The diplomatic tree for the Gauls then, instead of first and foremost focusing on more resources and the like, is aimed at improving your bonds with the other tribal factions, so that you as soon as possible can expand and become stronger by joining forces. Caesar and Gaul, therefore, while not the most versatile campaign, becomes interesting for its focused gameplay and interesting dynamics. And add on the fact that we now have 24 turns per year means that seasons and attrition will play a much larger role for your campaigns. It's also the first time that Rome 2 homes in on the actual historical characters like both Caesar and Mark Antony, for example. And as we'll see, this will become a theme going forward. The second campaign pack is Hannibal at the Gates, and by Jupiter this might be the best darnest Rome 2 expansion out there. Maybe. Hannibal at the Gates takes place during the Second Punic War, and as such is focused on the Western Mediterranean, and the map truly is what steals the show here for me. I mean, this is exactly how I would have wanted the Grand Campaign scale to be, with extreme detailed and defined mountains and hills, forests and coastlines, and a bunch more important and historical cities included. Since we're now also more focused, it allows for Hannibal at the Gate's main gameplay design, namely the war between Rome and Carthage, but importantly, their allies, to flourish. You see, both Rome and Carthage begin this game with defensive allies, military allies, enemies, and even client states, meaning we have ourselves a war between superpowers from the get-go. This sort of established faction dynamic is something that completely turns the Grand Campaign's starting position on its head, not just because you begin as rather powerful now, but because you have so many factions you deal closely with from the beginning. You see, more than anything, Hannibal at the Gates is actually about getting your alliance to victory rather than just your own faction. This is also why both Rome and Carthage both have a diplomatic tech tree that strongly focuses on improving relations with various cultures on this map, with one important distinction. The Romans will alongside the Italians and Africans improve relations with Iberian peoples, while Carthage on the other hand improves it with Celtic factions. This encourages each faction to hit the other where it hurts and with the people the other is closest in proximity to. For you see, even though your alliances and vassals last longer now, a lot can happen in the many turns this campaign spans, especially when the going gets tough and you're seeing your resources depleted. In other words, I love Hannibal at the Gate's focus on constant warfare, but a warfare that demands more than just soldiers. It also requires you to mind your relations at all times. Because while Hannibal is at the Gates, backstabbers might just be lurking behind the walls as well. There are three things about this campaign I'll say that I wish were improved upon. First is an extremely annoying visual bug where the coastlines are jagged and pixelated, a bug I've yet to see anywhere else and which ironically was not present at launch for me, so this might be something that's happened in the past years. Second is the fact that while a focus on diplomatic relations is great, I wish Rome 2 had more tools at its disposal. Rome 2 has no option for faction annexation, other than confederation of course, and so if you do wish to coast you after vassals just a bit more, 
You can't. And the only way to truly incorporate them is to go to war. And third, there are other factions here as well, like Syracuse, but sadly there's no updated tech tree or inherently new playstyles for them. It's a shame because while you can certainly try to make your own story here, Syracuse could have been made into a possible second power of sorts, one that could choose to go with either Rome or Carthage, and I wish the tech tree would reflect the campaign like that. In the end though, I love the sheer detail of this map, how rich Italy looks, that massive Sicily is just a beautiful sight to behold, and the focus on massive alliances from the get-go is a game-changer, making Hannibal at the Gates one of my favorite Rome 2 campaigns. Next up is Imperator Augustus, a campaign that takes us into the age of the Roman Civil War, with Octavian Augustus, Pompey, Mark Anthony, and Lepidus, soon to likely find themselves on opposing sides. Other than making a few minor changes to the Grand Campaign map, it takes us a few hundred years into the future and for the most part has us dealing with Roman allies and enemies. I never managed to fall in love with this campaign for some reason. Despite being in the very late Republic, our cities don't reflect that. We might be able to build most tier 1 versions of civic buildings, but they're not built already, and no new tech or options are introduced to the tech tree. In this way, it's not at all anything like the Barbarian Invasion campaign where you actually begin with massive cities with a ton of stuff built already because it simultaneously tries to simulate an early game and a late game, and for me it just doesn't work that well. What is cool though, is that we're here able to play as Egypt with Cleopatra as its queen, in a bid to overthrow the Roman yoke, even though you'll definitely have to maneuver well to be able to pull that off, especially seeing as you begin as Mark Antony's vassal. Our next campaign is Wrath of Sparta, and this is somewhat of a divisive one. Wrath of Sparta takes us back to the Peloponnesian War, offering a ginormous map of Greece and the Aegean in the year 432 BC. When I said earlier that I feel like the Grand Campaign version of Greece fails to do this place justice, this is exactly what I would have loved to see. 80 provinces in Greece? Sign me up is all I'm saying. And from the gorgeously detailed landscapes to the many city-states and kingdoms scattered across these lands, Wrath of Sparta is beautiful. What I like about this campaign is that it functions much like Hannibal at the Gates, only now it's Sparta versus Athens instead of Rome and Carthage, although there is more to this campaign than meets the eye. You see, while each alliance wants to destroy the other, you must take care not to be too aggressive. Capturing foreign capitals like Athens will net you massive diplomatic penalties in this campaign, meaning you better be ready to face the consequences. And while your fellow Greeks make up the immediate threat, the Persian Empire is always on the horizon, serving as an endgame threat when one of the Greek states are close to uniting the country. It's a really good setup, but sadly it doesn't go quite far enough. The Greek factions share technology systems, but none of these go to the lengths of Hannibal at the gates, and for some reason, there is no section dedicated to improving relations with other city-states or anything of the sort for hegemony, and similarly, no way to create confederations. Plus, since the Greeks often fight in similar ways, the battles of this campaign can feel a bit samey since everybody's using hoplites, and it's sad that Persia isn't playable at all. But as long as you love the setting, and are able to take advantage of the units that stand out, Wrath of Sparta really isn't half bad at all. It took three whole years for this next campaign to release, but when it did, it became one of the best packs for this game, namely Empire Divided. The question is whether it managed to become so on its own, or if it got help by releasing alongside the Power and Politics update, both courtesy of CA Sofia by the way. I think it definitely helped, and honestly, Empire Divided perhaps should have been an expansion to Attila rather than Rome 2, since it takes place just about a hundred years or so before the events of that game. We now find ourselves in a world dominated by Rome, only now the Empire is split into several warring factions, each vying for ultimate power. The main protagonist here is Emperor Aurelian, who fights to once again unite Rome against usurpers in the west and even the possible threat of Roman Palmyra in the east. What Empire Divided does to bring this time period even closer though is that it implements the banditry system, an interesting and unique way of representing lawlessness versus order in your provinces. It's also a cool feature that Empire Divided introduces a new building type, the cult which represents the breakdown of traditional Roman religion and the introduction of new faiths, one of these being the Christians before they were fully accepted into Roman society. It's a sad fact that Rome 2 doesn't make a distinction between culture and religion, so both Christianity and the other cults are treated as cultures as well, which I think removes some of the possible added depth here. Either way, it's up to you which cults you wish to promote in various provinces, or if you want to promote more than one at the same time. Just be mindful that they might not like each other very much, and even though they do bring some nice bonuses, they're also fairly costly, and since they represent a different culture, may even bring unexpected difficulties to public order and unity of your empire in the long run. 
The crisis of the 3rd century is an interesting time period indeed, and on the battlefield, it's evident that we are finding ourselves in Rome's transition period from that classical empire to the late empire and the evolving armor and outfitting of legionaries and Roman cavalry. All in all, Despite a few shortcomings, Empire Divided offers a grand scale campaign on essentially the same map as Imperator Augustus. And even though I would have liked a new and expanded map, I find it charming and a very interesting choice of a hitherto unexplored setting. But despite an affinity for certain settings, we might just have saved the best for last. Rise of the Republic. The very last campaign pack which released as late as 2018 if you can believe it, sees us travel all the way back to the 4th century BC when Rome was still a wee lad. I take back what I said about wanting Hannibal at the gates map scale for the Grand Campaign by the way. This is the scale I want. This truly massive and uber focused map of Italy which is simply stunning and lends so much more depth and detail to every faction and region involved. And there are quite a few playable factions here actually, ranging from the Romans, who finally have a port in the so often forgotten city of Ostia, to the various Etruscan tribes, the Samnites, and even Greeks over in Syracuse and the south of Italy. Their technology trees vary slightly, and I particularly like that the Etruscan tech tree considers the Romans to be their silly little brothers, but at least a brother who can be traded with. But what truly makes Rise of the Republic so much better than anything else out there is because it's actually using a quasi Warhammer slash Troy game system of unique faction mechanics. The government type window has been exchanged for actual gameplay mechanics, which is such a great change that I cannot actually believe CA Sophia managed to implement it in Rome 2 of all places. As Rome, you are able to now choose between two abilities called elections. You can now elect consuls, requiring that you have at least two experienced generals, and you can elect a dictator, having it lasting a few turns, but knitting you some great buffs for that duration. You can even choose which generals you'd like to appoint, making the game feel so much more personalized and historical. The Etruscans will hold a summit, ending in a buff to either a military or civic aspect of the game. The people of Syracuse can sponsor colonial voyages, bringing back faction-wide bonus resources, while the Greeks of Tyrus are more philosophical in nature, allowing them to speed up their tech research. The Samnites are able to instantly spawn a 20-unit army, and the Gauls of Zenones will receive perks to generals when fighting specific cultures. This is quite literally what Rome 2 needed from the start, and what every classic historical total war game have lacked. And you see how this functions as something of a prototype system for Troy, which CA Sophia went on to make just two years after. What's awesome though and kind of hiding out in the shadows across the sea is Carthage, who at this point is the undisputed superpower of the western Mediterranean. But just like in Wrath of Sparta, they're kind of hanging out where they are, on Sardinia and parts of Sicily, until something major happens and a worthy opponent is crowned in Italy. It's a great way to create an endgame crisis even though Rise of the Republic overall offers a tougher campaign than most. I love the idea of an Italy that isn't just Rome and like two other factions, but to see it at this early stage, a stage when Roman supremacy was far from decided and had yet to even hang in the balance. It's just awesome and it's reflected even on the battlefield where these early unitypes are well modeled and has a distinctly different look than the much later period. With all of these factions considered, it truly is a fantastic campaign and I'm happy it became the final addition to the Rome 2 saga. From its reveal in 2012 to the final campaign pack in 2018, Rome 2 has been on a longer journey than most games out there, and it's such a vastly different product from its release that it's kind of mind-blowing. But I think it's the case for many that if you didn't like Rome 2's fundamental aspects on launch, like the way battles worked, the provinces and so on and so forth, you probably wouldn't enjoy it all those years later either. And that's fair of course, Rome 2 is not the product I wanted it to be. But it is a simple fact that it has come much closer to fulfill my expectations for it. And in some ways, although not all, as with the mechanics and depth of a campaign like Rise of the Republic, even surpassed them. Let me know your thoughts on Rome 2 throughout the years in the comments, and remember to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. It would also mean the world to me if you decided to join the channel as a member, which really helps support my work and will let me bring you more videos just like this one. Thanks again, Roma Invicta, and furthermore, I believe that Total War Attila's performance must be fixed. And I'll see you next time. Cheers.